And I think Initial was the first one who really started to get us like reviews. And to be honest, most of them were pretty bad. Like they'd just be like, who the fuck is this band? She's trying to sound, <laughs> trying to sound like the promise ring. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, if you happen to have a connection to anyone from the band Limp, not Biscuit, Limp, or Rocket From The Crypt, just email thiswasthescene at gmail.com and let me know how I can get in touch with them. The Jazz June was formed in 96 by students attending Kutztown University. The group recorded its first full-length album in 97. Their first two albums were recorded through Canadian record label Workshop Records. In 98, the band signed with Initial Records and went on to release three albums through the record label. They disbanded in 2003 after four full-length albums, but reunited for benefit shows in 2006 and the release of an Outtakes and Rarities compilation the following year. In 2014, the group announced they were reforming and releasing new material on Top Shelf Records. Andrew had emailed me a while back and we started just kind of bullshitting here and there. And I was like, yo, let's uh, let's have a little convo. And uh, so he was like, yes, let's do so. So I got him on the Skype, and this is what we chat about. The meaning of Jazz June, Taco Bell, people we dislike from high school, City Gardens, John Cheese and Punk Rock Realtors, Making Rolling Stones Top 40 List, Jay Robbins, When the Drums Kick In, The Built to Spill Story, and a ton more. Check out the release of their album, The Medicine, or the re-release of the album, The Medicine, on tape by Friend Club Records. You can also check out his new band, Post Skeleton. There's a link in the show notes that you can just click on that and go check it out. It's really good. Uh, so you should go check that out if you're looking for some new new tunes. Lastly, I have a comic called Daily Bread on Instagram. If you want to go follow it, I just draw daily drawings for the last four and a half years. So uh, you can just go to your daily bread, B-R-E-D, and give me a follow. The most fun I have with the Instagram account is in the stories because I just find things that make me laugh and post them. So uh, if you want to check that out, just go to your daily bread. Also, you should follow my Instagram for this podcast, which I didn't realize I didn't really advertise. Just go to Instagram and look up This Was The Scene. I put teasers leading up to the the episode. So Monday and Thursday, I'll do a teaser of uh, some clips from the episode, and then Friday, I launch it. And then I try to post things through here and there, and there's like quizzes and polls and stuff I do in the story. So go check it out. Give me a follow, uh, because that also helps this thing get found by people, because um, there's a lot of people out there that don't know about this, and the more people listen to it, the more I'm going to want to keep doing this shit. That's all I got to say, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. You're in London? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been here for like... 14 years. How did you guys, didn't you just record some, oh wait, you recorded some stuff with your new band. Yeah, Post Skeleton is the band that I'm in from London, but um, I actually did the, the the last Jazz June album in like 2013. I was living here then, we just did it, well we did lots of demos over the internet basically. I would like record a acoustic track and to uh, into like pro tools and then send it to our drummer and bassist and guitarist and they would add their tracks and then we kind of like demoed lots of different songs and then yeah the first time we actually paid them live would be like in the studio so you guys actually go to a studio together yeah because they at the time i mean this was a couple of years ago now at the time they were all in still around like the philadelphia area and i was in london but um this is pre-kids so I could go over, visit like my parents and then spend an extra week like hanging out with those guys, like rehearsing. And then so we did a few shows like because pretty early on when we decided to do some new music, Top Shelf Records was interested. So they put us on like their CMJ shows and we put a few gigs here and there. So I'd come over, rehearse for the gigs, play some of the songs from like the Internet demos. And then eventually when we were kind of ready for our first like EP, I guess. We went to a studio in Philadelphia, Philadelphia, which I can never remember the name of. It's one of the guys who's in, oh, God damn it. Now I can't remember the name of the song. Oh, Hop Along. He's like, I think he's the bassist for Hop Along. So he he recorded our five song demo, which we put out like a seven inch with Dikembe. And then after that, we went to, for like a full week, to Gradwell Studio, Gradwell Studios in New Jersey, and did the full uh, the full length. Did you? In, 
try to think of this like how to say this like when i've gotten back together with our old band and played it's the idea sounds great and then we're <laughs> when we play it's cool but when we're practicing and all the other stuff i just fucking hate it like what is your thoughts when you guys get back together it's like is it daunting or do you enjoy the whole process yeah i think it's like well especially when you're living in another country and like sending around demos and you're like really psyched on it because it's like yeah new and fun and cool and then you get together and I love hanging out with the guys because I've known them for like 20 something years. Like we all went to college together and have stayed in touch for years and years. But yeah, sometimes when you get in the practice space, you're like, oh, shit. Like because you have kind of like an expectation of it. It's sounding this being like this amazing, amazing thing. But because you haven't played together for so long, it does take a while to like warm up. And you're like, oh, God, what have I done? I've just flown over here from another country to, <laughs> to do this. Was this like a big mistake? <laughs> Yeah, it sounds weird yeah, too. Like when you're when you're when you're setting a demo, it's it's clean and you're you're setting a track. I mean, a demo could be a little rough, but it's it's all cut together nicely to make sense. Then when you get together, like p- some people are fucking up, the timing could be kind of going up, like increasing or decreasing, and it's just also the room that you pick and then the the amps you're using. So it's all it's it's almost like back in the day where you had a good show and a bad show and you knew that right from the first fucking note, how it was going to go. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Cause I remember showing up to some gigs, you know, when we were in Kutztown going to school, we would take like any gig and because there was not a lot of, you know, there's a lot of hardcore stuff going on, but like, there wasn't a lot of like, you know, more to post hardcore emo stuff going on. So yeah, there would just be someone who would, sometimes we'd play in like a, a car garage with like two little gorilla speakers on tires and it was just like yeah it sounded off you couldn't hear a single thing except cymbals and drums and yeah you like is no matter how excited you were for the gig as soon as you play the first note and you can't hear anything you're like oh this is this is awful yeah and you're like oh this is the vibe this is what i'm gonna I have to like either get around this or this is just the way it's gonna stick one thing I noticed real quick, just with the, when you're talking, you sound like you've adopted a little bit of the London accent, like just tiny, oh, no. tiny little bit. Like just certain <laughs> certain words you said. Like, have you noticed when you sing that there's a little bit of a difference now? It's funny. I don't because in my head, I'm always trying to stay like soup. I'm trying to become more New Jersey as time goes on so I can like maintain my identity. But it's funny because I was doing some other random like – music with a friend of mine i use the phrase charade instead of charade and he's like what the, who the fuck do you think you are you think you're british now <laughs> <laughs> you uppity bitch <laughs> <laughs> exactly but like i kind of like it because especially when you're writing like lyrics and you're you know you're trying to like either rhyme shit or mm. you know make things sound come together smoothly i can i feel like i can mix up you know i can say garage instead of ga- garage and charade and you know just whatever fits you know the sort of song so yeah sometimes it works in my advantage but it's funny because when i also like when i went to again with the jazz june gigs i went back to austin to play fun 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 fest and our friend courtney who's like born and raised in texas was like y'all sound like you're from London now, you know? And I was like, no, like no one in London would ever think I sound like British. You know what I mean? It's yeah. just, just funny, different people's perspectives. I was doing some Googling just because I usually have a bunch of tabs open in front of me. And this is just a funny thing that I didn't know. And I'm sure you guys did, but I didn't realize that Jazz June was slang for doing the nasty. Yeah, there's, um, there's a whole, yeah, we did kind of run into some, um, you know, because we, we found out about it, or I did, I can't remember exactly, in like some sort of like, um, you know, modern poetry class. And it was like a really cool poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, you know, we jazz June, we die soon. And and it was like about these sort of like cool guys hanging out in like a pool hall and just like drinking and causing a, a trouble and stuff. And, you know, we, we, were, we kind of aspired to be that, you know, but in, on like a very surface level. But then, yeah, there are – then when I sort of like studied a little bit more into it, there are sort of like undertones of like sexual, um, yeah, misbehavior uh, and things like that. But by, th- by the time we kind of learned about that, it was almost too late. It was like we'd already had a couple albums <laughs> named oh, wow. the Jazz June. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But, yeah. So it was like years after yeah i mean well people would come up to us and show and be like do you know what that means and like we got to the point where we'd be like actually that's just one interpretation of it you know what i mean it's like 
but yeah, obviously all very subjective, but it was just like a very cool um, sort of phrase at the time. And obviously we're trying to come up with something that was like of the time, you know, there was, there was, there was just so many cool bands, like again, post hardcore, just coming up with like these cool creative names. We thought stealing a, a phrase from a poem was like the coolest kind of name we could could choose at the time i kind of dig it though because it's like it's like i have a uh like a handful of buddies from high school that i'm still tight with and i like always drop their names in this podcast all the time and uh it's like you have your crew like i think guys have it more than girls do because i have a lot of girlfriends that i have they're like i don't really have any friends from back then i was like man like i know a lot of guys that i've met through the 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 ages or whatever the, the years where they've they're like oh, i have like a, a handful of buddies and it seems like that name jazz you in the way it's presented in that poem or that book you're saying it kind of encompasses that like this is exactly our, our crew that's cool yeah yeah it was kind of like, and you know we were um funny enough like i didn't know many a couple of the guys from the jazz june i met like during the first practice and and then we eventually asked brian who i was in another like hardcore straight edge band called atari with we asked him to play guitar but like they had all gone to to high school together down in Doylestown and they asked, they were like, Oh, we're starting this band. And it was like my second year of college. And like literally the first week came up with my guitar, started playing with them, had only met them the first kind of practice. But yeah, we all became like this really tight knit crew. And especially I'm sure, you know, the same. It's like when you're, when you're like touring in a tiny van, you do have to be kind of like look out for each other and, you know, like you can't sort of go and spend all the little bit of merch money on like food for one person you've got to like okay instead of one of us eating well we're all gonna eat peanut butter sandwiches (laughs) yeah we're all getting taco bell (laughs) exactly again again (laughs) for like so yeah you you do become this like band of brothers in a way that's kind of like okay one for one all for one not to say we didn't like fight and argue and everything all the time but you did have to kind of like look out for each other i think to that point and before i start kind of talking about the origins you guys i think that a being in a band as a young person's game because of oh yeah the, the the traveling aspect when you're younger it's it's brand new to you so it's exciting and then the food aspect I remember when we'd eat Taco Bell, I was always like, oh, yeah, Taco Bell, or like Wendy's, yeah. or like, oh, Wendy's. <laughs> if I ate that diet now, about, I'd be two days in and be like, I, my stomach can't do this shit. Like, I can't no. handle this at all. Like, so I think as a younger person, your, your body's just like, we don't really know that much. And you're like, okay, well, now we can destroy you. So uh, we, we can stay on the road and not make money. For us, we were like, we came from eating in the like college cafeteria, which wasn't, you know, much above, you know, those burger. I mean, I was, I think I was vegetarian most of the time, but all that kind of food is pretty much fast food anyway. So going on the road and having, ta- you're like, Oh, Taco Bell. I remember we had this like um, one tour, I think we were out for a couple of weeks and there was some sort of like star Wars Taco Bell competition. It was like, if you get all the pieces on this circular board, you know, you win like, I don't know, $100,000 or something. We're like, dude, we're definitely going to fucking win. Like, who else <laughs> is driving around the country eating Taco Bell every single day? And like, it was funny. It got to the point where we had like, I don't know, maybe 10 out of the 12. And we would go to these gigs and we would announce on the mic, like, we're looking for like Boba Fett and whatever. And someone would be like, dude, I've got one at home. And we'd be like, holy shit. So we'd like literally get in the van and drive to their house. And they'd be like, oh, no, it's this one. We're like, oh, man, we've got six of those. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's so much Taco Bell we ate. That's genius, dude. I never <laughs> thought about how those old games like that would have worked. We just kind of bled or what's the word? Like kind of snuck into the whole band lifestyle where you're like, we could we could actually win this. We eat this shitty all the time. Yeah, like who else is driving around eating Taco Bell every day in different parts of the country? Like that surely that sort of like lottery type of uh, luck is never going to be on anyone else. But then we realized it was just actually just an unwinnable game because we literally went, we just, you know, purposely ate Taco Bell every day just to, to win this this competition or whatever it was. And yeah, it we just couldn't get like the two final pieces I was gonna say, if you didn't finish that question, you're like, who would drive around and eat Taco Bell all day? I was gonna be like the Midwest. 
Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's pretty much. Sorry to Midwest <laughs> listeners, but it's true. Um, and bef- and I, I had one more question that I saw that I, it just came to me, and I was like, this seems like a funny question to ask. You had posted on your Facebook page for Jazz June that it was a question about Riot Fest, I believe. Oh, yeah. And it was like, which smaller bands would you see or something like that? Um, can anyone recommend who to check out from this list of the lesser known bands? So when I saw that, I started reading through it and I was like, this would be a funny question. What like bands today that are older that you see on these, this festivals and you're like, they should stop playing. (laughs) I was like, Um, this is such a put on the spot question, but I was like, I'm just going to ask it to see what your thoughts are. Well, I feel like, well, okay. So I'm going to probably have a different answer than you think, but like, I don't know. Is is that Misfits? Is that with Danzig? I mean, because I know they've had different singers, and I always they had that like weird Misfits album with like a new singer that I thought was weird. It's the original then, Misfits, it says. So. Oh, I, is it? Okay, okay, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, because I'm trying to think. Like Descendants is on there. Obviously, they're awesome. Alkaline Trio, like they're you know, I definitely see them. As far as like the bands that are still playing that shouldn't be, I don't know. That's that's a hard one. I def I definitely have an answer for that. I just can't think of one. Like I totally know what you mean about some of the bands that just like keep going despite the fact that you know it's like what are you doing? Like does anyone care anymore? But I guess they do because if they're getting on Riot Fest, they obviously must have some sort of I don't know what are the what are like the criteria anymore for Riot Fest is it like amount of Spotify plays I mean who, I don't know. who knows I think it's a bit of nostalgia mixed with bands that are new because there's there's a couple bands on here like Movements they're a newer band I love them and they're they're kind of like a be- right below the Saturday list where it's like Sunny Day Real Estate Bad Religion so those are the bigger fonts and then underneath that you got stories so far which they're really fucking good um, yeah but then you got like the front bottoms who are kind of old but kind of and, and is still relevant but then you got guar who i mean you know guar <laughs> fucking guar like they should never stop even though the singer's dead then fears on there so it's like this crazy mix of old and new yeah i mean yellow card i mean i don't know i don't, I don't know <laughs> yeah do they mad ball i'm sure there's always an audience for them and then the rest of them seem like you know newer bands like i love the ma- the band name mannequin pussy i've never heard them but it seems like a cool band. <laughs> this is a, um, this question's such a trap too <laughs> i don't like... mind man i'm fine I'm fine with the uh, chastity is cool i like them i've heard them recently i mean jimmy Eat world i've never been a huge fan of them to be honest oh, but dude. i know a lot of people are super into them i just saw them a few months ago and they I used to love them. I don't, the newer stuff, I think about three or four albums ago, I stopped really paying attention. There's a couple songs here and there, but I love their older stuff. When I saw them play live, though, they just fucking shredded. They were so, really? cool. okay. oh yeah, they were so, so amazing. Like they could still pull it off in a, in a big setting like that. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. I mean, you know, I think it's one of those bands. I don't know. I think, I feel like we did play one show with them but it was like it was like one of these horrible like North Carolina massive venue. No one was there. We we played on like a Tuesday night with them, where and it was like us watching them and them watching us. But um, obviously they went. And up. you didn't like them at the time. I don't know. You know what? I have like a very skewed version of view of this. Like Promise Ring, Get Up Kids, and some of those other bands. Like not that I obviously I listen to them now and I like them, but because I was. I don't know. I was like, we were so we were just compared to them so much that I just started to not like them because I'd listen to them and be like, we don't sound like them, you know. And then for some reason, something in my mind would be like, oh, I hate them now, you know. Which which obviously was ridiculous because they're obviously really cool bands. But because we we kept playing with them and people, there was I remember there was even a zine out of Philly. It was like one of the one of the um, distros. And they had like a little icon and it was like quicksand, sunny day, real estate and Slayer. And it was like every single band (laughs) that was around, they would put one of those little symbols on it. It's like, those are the three bands that everyone was starting, trying to sound like. And obviously we would get pegged with like the, you want to sound like sunny day, real estate and the promise ring kind of thing, just because we were just like not hardcore 
and it was like a somewhat new type of music. And I think a lot of people also would be like, you're just trying to get on a major label by playing, you know, by singing instead of screaming. So <laughs> I just, you know, I just, I, it's such a funny thing, like whatever, 19, 20 year old kids talking shit on like the early version of the internet. And you're just kind of like fighting against whatever they're trying to put on you. It's all really silly, but it's all really funny to look back on. I can see that. When I was listening to you guys, because I remember you guys being on a bunch of obscure comps and and then seeing your CD and like it'd be one of those where you know like some random comp would come out, but it was the newer there was the comps that were the poppy punk ones, but then there was the new ones that had the the new technical sound. Like you guys are very technical and very really funny yeah, yeah. with the guitar and shit like that. Like that started to expand where really good musicians started creating albums. So then those comps would be more like mechanical sounding and like in, in interesting. And, and then like your guys CD, I remember would, would be, you know, like your friend would have their CD books, the the black cases that were just the soft case, and you'd flip through yes, with all yeah, your. Yeah. I, like your guys CD reminds me of that one of those where I would see it in there mixed with, coalesce and then homegrown you know it'd be this random hodgepodge of shit yeah um, totally yeah but i remember i remember you guys and i was, I was re-listening to your stuff on spotify and like one of your songs ended up popping into my spotify list where like i have a playlist that i just kind of curate all the time and then you can hit this button that it'll choose and just add songs to your playlist. oh yeah yeah i know what you mean yeah and it did that with you guys and the song, and I was like, and I was trying to find it before because I can't find. It. I was like, dude, the song fucking shreds, and I'm so mad because I can't. I have to like look through my playlist to see if I can find it again. Oh yeah, met the medicine. That was it. Oh cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. just kind of just like snuck into my list. I was like, oh, this is perfect timing. So I'll be <laughs> talking to you. But um, all right, I'm jumping all over the place, so now I'm gonna hone it in. So all right, man. So you know the premise of this whole thing. It's all very nostalgia and talking about the late 90s early 2000s and things so um i actually did a poll on my instagram to see if i should keep asking this question because i was like i wonder if people are think it's relevant and a larger like the majority said yeah so what got you involved in the scene was it you know what i'm gonna ask it differently like, look what got you involved in the scene i'm gonna leave out all the other parts that i asked for that i question. think it was like like so i started off like skateboarding when i was like i don't know really young like sixth grade or something like that i had some older friends and my brother was older and he was a skater at the time and i remember going to like this guy's house and he had like a fucking tiny little jump ramp in his driveway and he put on like minor threat and the misfits and i remember hearing that and just being just totally like what the fuck is this i don't think i necessarily liked it at the time because it was just like so abrasive and like screamy and crazy but it was just something that drew me in. It was like some sort of like, it's like when the kind of like um, the sort of uh, this the creepy music in like a murder scene in like a horror film. You're just like, what is this? It's just something intriguing about that sound. It was all through skateboarding though, like that kind of thing. And then like different skate videos would have different like hardcore bands and some of that California kind of stuff. And then I remember there was an entire skate video that had like they just use no effects ribbed as like the soundtrack to the entire, like every part. So um, yeah, just through that, I just was like really intrigued about this, this kind of like crazy abrasive, weird music that like was in all these skate videos and stuff. And uh, as being like a very young and impressionable kid, I just kind of like ate it all up and um, you know, sort of taped as many like records off of my brother as I could. He was really into like, sort of like the New Jersey hardcore straight edge kind of stuff. And you grew up in Jersey? Yeah. So I was like in, I don't know if you know. Yeah. So Red Bank, Lincroft area. So um, it wasn't too far from New York City, like on the train. Once I got older, I could jump on the train and go up whenever I wanted to skate the Brooklyn Banks or eventually go to shows and stuff like that. Oh, but um, also, yeah, like also right right on the beach. You know, we're like 10 minutes from the beach. So we kind of have like a surf skate kind of thing going on <clears throat> and again with that then it was like hardcore everything from like minor threat and straight edge to um pennywise and no effects and stuff and at that point even like i started to listen like dinosaur jr and some indie stuff i was just like a real sponge for anything because basically because a lot of like older friends from my high school 
would just be into stuff. You know, I would just like, you know, at that point when you're a kid, you just like, you like everything, you know what I mean? You know, like now I'm total snob about stuff, but then I just like every single piece of music I heard that wasn't like, I don't know, on the radio, I just loved and I would try to like tape it off them on like set tapes and they would make me like little comps and stuff like that. Yeah, it just drew me in and, and just the whole vibe around it because also I went to a very like, Rah rah football high school. So I was gonna ask you that. Like, where did you fit in? Where where were you like plugged into as far as the 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 school scene was? Yeah, it was it was very much like such. It's so funny too because when I talk to people in London or the you know the UK now, and they're like, "What was it like in high school?" I'm like, "It's exactly like the movies. It was like you go into the parking lot and it's like the jocks versus the skaters and the hippies. You know, there's like a brawl in the parking." <laughs> Like it starts off with someone talking trash in wood shop and all of a sudden they're like, after school, I'm going to meet you by the parking lot. And there'd just be like a big, you know, fight and, and that kind of thing. So, um, see, I'm very much identified as being that sort of like other side of like the, the football team and the cheerleaders and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it was just like an identity thing. It was like, I'm on this side. And, and, I, and also, again, because I had older friends. I didn't feel as uh, sort of intimidated. Not that I really even got into many of the fights. I kind of would like, I took the bus, so I missed all the fights in the parking lot. But, um, you know, I felt like I had a little bit of a crew. And and that was everyone from like, sort of like stoner hippie dudes to um, some of the goths, like anyone who wasn't like really into football and, and, and into school sports and things like that. We were all on like the other side, but there was enough of us that we could, we weren't like intimidated or scared. Do you think that pushed you more towards the the song, the music when I think for me personally, when I would hear anything that I think that reason I like things that weren't on the radio is because I couldn't stand the people that liked the shit on the radio. because <laughs> They were such fucking assholes. So do you think like I know my answer. Do you think for you what pushed you towards liking that different sound was was it was pushing you so much further away from the jocks and that crowd? Yeah, totally. And like my family was super religious as well. So it was kind of like against all of that. You know, it was just like a rebellion kind of thing. You know, my my parents made me go to church like every Sunday. I was even an altar boy and stuff until basically I was 16. And I was just like, I refuse to go and you could no longer force me to go kind of thing. Um, So yeah, it was just a total rebellion. And yeah, it's funny you say that because I remember it was like, I was really into Red Hot Chili Peppers. And then they came out with I guess it was blood sugar sex magic. And I remember this girl in my class who really, really hated started singing under the bridge in class. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. I, <laughs> Fuck you. Now I hate that fucking band. I fucking hate this man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if she, if Lisa Commander is singing this song, I'll never fucking listen to the, <laughs> the Red Hot Chili Peppers anymore. I love that we always know the full name of anybody from our high school, especially the fucking assholes. <laughs> it's like fucking <laughs> yeah. Joe Antonucci, that piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, Lou, Lou D'Alessio. I hope all three of them don't hear this. That'll, that'll be really bad for us well funny enough you know they all became like um they all kind of went down a different route after high school i think one of them ended up like being a drug dealer and everything else so i think they all they all sort of like probably realized the error in their ways and yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah me and my buddies still follow like all the the dirts from our high school on facebook will message each other like dude did you check this fucking post out oh my god <laughs> yeah. um so like what got you into going to local shows I had, again, I had a couple of friends who were like, were older and luckily, like, again, some of the skaters who I would hang out with like every single day, there was these two brothers, Derek and Craig Bush, and their parents are really cool. Like they let them build a mini ramp in their little, in their garage. And like, they had all these like ramps and stuff. So I, I could skate to their house and I'd go there like every day. And just like at the same time that I started really getting into like hardcore, this guy Derek did, and he had a car and like, you know, I think we ended up going to like one, I don't remember what the first show was, but it was like, we went to that show and then we saw a flyer and he's like, do you want to go to the, that one next weekend? I'm like, fuck yeah. And then it was like, you just go to one show and get a flyer for the next one and just keep on going. That just kind of really exposed me to a lot of different shows. Like at that time, there was a lot of shows at this place called Middlesex County College. They have these huge, like, it was a pretty huge space. It was like the, you know, ma- massive basketball court at this like community college and they would have like strife mouthpiece integrity like huge like and all the shows would be 
the like Sunday matinees with like eight bands. You know, you, my parents were were super strict, so I'd have to be home by ten, but I could kind of like go to those kind of day shows. And then sometimes we would sneak out and. I'd be like, oh, I'm sleeping over Derek's house. And we would like go up to the city and go to Maxwell's and go to like city or even like city gardens down in Trenton and see like Bad Religion or I mean, I even saw Green Day down there before they were huge. And some of the DC bands like Shudder the Think and Fugazi and stuff like that. Yeah, it was just kind of like that was the thing I did. I didn't drink. Yeah, I didn't go to parties because I didn't really hang out with anyone many people from high school. So it was like, what do we do? Go to a show. And we would just go to any show that we had a flyer for. Some of them were like basement shows at different people's houses and stuff like that. Yeah, it was just the thing we did. I love it. I I had such a different experience because I started going to Legion Halls. And when I hear the people that I talk to in interview, when you guys start talking about City Gardens and all these bands, I'm like, holy shit, I was so behind on all this great these live shows because i came in after the fact when a lot of those bands broke up or stopped playing and then i got their cds and was like holy shit i can't see this band or be like green day and they were just just blowing the fuck up so you couldn't see them in a club and you guys got to like see this shit that's so wild yeah it's funny city gardens was just such a crazy club because they would have such good shows there and like a real diverse you know they had everything from like Green Day to Youth of Today to even like the Luna Chicks and, you know, so, you know, like anything sort of like alternative. And it was a pretty big club. I think probably a couple hundred, couple hundred um, people could fit in it. But I remember it was in like the absolute worst part of town where you'd go and just pray that your car didn't like, you you know, you'd borrow your dad's car to drive there and just pray it didn't get broke into because it was in like a really bad part of town. And I remember my brother was like for my birthday present. I must have been like 16 because I couldn't drive yet. I think it was Bad Religion. He was like, he got me Bad Religion tickets. And he's like, all right, I'll drive you and like two friends to go. And it's like the best present ever. But then it ended up where he was like, his friend got a house down by the shore. He was like, all right, I'm going to go for the, to the shore. But like, dad will drive you to the show and I'll meet you there. And then like, I'll drive you home. But my dad went down there and he was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> he's like we're in the middle of like the worst part of trenton and i'm just gonna leave my 16 year old kid here and he's walking around and it's funny because there was all these kids online with like i think it was definitely a bad religion because everyone had like these big pink and blue mohawks and my dad had like you know he was wearing like jacked up socks and his like running shorts and a big gatorade hat and my <laughs> friends and i were so embarrassed and he was like andrew there's not enough fire exits in this place Are you kidding me you know and i was like dad <laughs> shut up you know what i mean like <laughs> at that time like the most embarrassing thing that could ever happen your dad goes to the bad religion show complaining about the fire exits and shit so yeah, i think i um, lucked out in that aspect because i started <laughs> i was driving by the time i started going to shows so i didn't get dropped off by my mom <laughs> or like my dad and had to go through that <laughs> fucking embarrassment yeah it was so funny so how does the band so how like has the band start well, I was in a few really funny bands in high school. Um, we had a couple of variations. First, we were called Simsara, which uh, I don't know what we stole that from. And then we were called Regret, which is like such a bad name, like Regret. <laughs> and, then, and then we had a band. And then we had a band called D's Nuts, which I guess we just thought was funny. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so we, I don't know, that's how it kind of like figured out how to play guitar in a band like through all these really 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 terrible high school bands and then when i got to kutztown i was yeah first day of, of school so kutztown is like in the middle of nowhere pennsylvania but it's got a really good arts program so like if you didn't get into universe you know university of the arts in philadelphia like every kid from pennsylvania went to kutztown as like their section option because it was really good but a lot cheaper and like obviously not as expensive as going to philly so like the first day i met all these kids who had already had this um straight edge hardcore band called atari because i was wearing like a falling forward shirt or whatever hardcore shirt they like saw me on campus immediately were like really cool so i started hanging with them playing in that band wait it was called it was called atari it was just atari oh that would have that would have worked against you later on yeah they had a, their first song was called joystick fury so it was like this sort of like i don't know old school 80s you know obviously i think right at the time when atari teenage riot kind of came out but um anyway we um 
so I started playing with them and we would play around campus and just like little shows. And every once in a while we'd play like with some of these like bigger floor punch or something like that, um, opening up in like Scarlet's and like Emmaus and all these random parts of Pennsylvania. And then because of that, some of the guys who eventually I would join the jazz dude, they just knew that I was like playing guitar in this band. And we had a mutual friend, Marnie, who she knew that I was into more than just hardcore. And that kind of talked about wanting to start a band that was less, um, hardcore and straight up punk rock. So when Dan and Justin were looking for guitars, she kind of recommended me. They just called me up and said, hey, when we come back to campus in September, do you want to play together? And I was like, yeah, cool. And it's kind of just how it went. And just, yeah, just really got on with them and started playing on campus shows and weird and the weird little house shows and basement shows for the first year until we finally figured out how to like get a show at a, a real with like a real promoter and stuff. Did you guys... Like how soon after that did you guys get on initial records? Oh, that was actually a couple of years later because. Um, no, were you, okay, so before that, then did you guys put out any releases out or get on any smaller labels prior to that? Yeah, yeah. So there was a couple like Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania labels. They even had some festivals and a lot of shows. And there was a place called Double Decker Records that had like a, you know, they would promote shows and then. Again, from then, if a band from out of town would play, we would like make friends with them, and then we would go play further into Pennsylvania. And that's how we met the guys from uh, Mid Carson July. They came through and played a gig. We met them, and then they took us on like a weekend tour out to like Pittsburgh, and then we'd go a little bit farther out to Ohio. And then at some point, you know, we would we would have met whoever put out our first seven inch. I can't remember the name of the the label. It was like their first or second release, so they put out a seven inch by us. And then our first tour was like a real ramshackled mess of like a show in Ohio and then a show in Pittsburgh and then back to, you know, Chicago, you know, one of those just like play any gig you can and just stay in the van for a whole week. And on that, we played a, this like day festival in Pittsburgh and this guy, Mike Wessel was there <clears throat> and he had a record label out, out of Ontario. I think he put out like a grade seven inch and f this band Franklin who was like a Philadelphia band that our bassist, his brother was like friends with them. So we kind of knew the guy. And uh, yeah, he's like, let's do a, an album. I guess he just liked us from seeing our set. And um, we did an album and then an EP with him. And that's when we started touring. So anytime we had Christmas break, summer break, Easter break, we would just literally either book a show ourselves, or eventually we got like a booking agent who was doing kind of like decent sized bands, which then brought us to Louisville, Kentucky. And that's when we met um, Andy from, from initial, but it wasn't, it was probably like three or four years after we were literally playing every single weekend, any show we could play, we'd just hop in the van Friday afternoon after class, drive to Chicago, play a show, play Ohio on the way back, play some random place in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania on the way back from that, and then go back to class on Monday. So we were putting in the sort of miles on the East Coast, at least. I know that Brian in his interview, his interview was episode 127 for everybody listening. But uh, yeah, he, because I was looking at my notes, and I was like, wonder, I, I was like, I know he talked about you guys, but I put it in my show notes, he talked about you guys in gray, gray AM. Yes, gray AM. Yeah, we put with them loads. Okay. Yeah. So I was like, I hadn't, I forget when his interview. I feel like it was, it was like last year. It feels like very long ago, but um, I think it was last year. So, yeah, when you guys when you guys started playing shows together, like what what was like your that was like in the beginning of you guys starting to play? Yeah, because I invited Midcross in July to play like my basement in Kutztown. And I was so naive. I was just like, yeah, you know, we played the show up the road with um, Franklin, and you know, they made like. $60 or something like that. And so I kind of like unknowingly promised them like 60 or $80. And then it was just like a college party. And I was like, I couldn't really charge at the door because it was just like my friends. So I was like, oh, there's a bucket in the corner, you know, throw some money in. There ended up being like $10 in it in the end. But so I had promised them like oh, no. at least money because they lived in like the middle of Pennsylvania. This place called Sunbury. It took forever. So I guess they were like, okay, let's play this sort of like college kids house and we opened for them and then one of our other friends bands played and yeah i was kind of like here's 15 bucks sorry but they're really cool and, and because they're a bit older like brian and his brother were a little bit older 
they like kind of took us under the wing and everything from like, okay, we'll take you on in like a weekend tour outside of Kutztown, even to like, they'd be like, you guys need to like, you know, move around a little bit more on stage and like do this and do that. They would kind of like coach just um, on how to like, just be a bit more of a, a better live band. So they became like our sort of uh, mentors in a way <laughs> for like emo rock music and, uh, and pushed us. And they, they would always be like in every song, have a weird part, you know, like no matter how poppy or, or like sort of like basic the song is just chuck a weird part in there, you know, you got to do it, you know, and, and that would help, that'll help you like, you know, become better musicians and, you know, stand out from the crowd. So they were like, yeah, very sort of seminal in, in our, in our early days of the jazz June, helping us uh, learn the ways. When you guys started, were you, cause I saw a bunch of videos on YouTube and there's three guitars and then a bass player. Is that right? Am I seeing this right? Yeah, we had that for a while. Um, yeah, was that the beginning when you guys had that? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like maybe the first couple shows we had two guitars, and then like I said, the guy that was in the Straight Edge band, Atari, we asked him to play on third guitar. But that was that was blatantly because we went to go see this band, the Transmagetti, and they had three guitars, and we're like, okay, we need a third guitarist because it was just so loud and so cool. So we just stole that kind of concept. You know, none of us were really great guitar players, but it seemed like we were bigger than the, the sum of our parts because it was just a much louder sound. So people couldn't figure out that we, none of us really knew what we were playing. But <laughs> when all the distortion mixed together, it just sounded like a kind of big, loud noise, basically. I feel like you guys had like a very technical guitar sound, though. So I guess maybe in the very beginning, it was just more just strumming and power chords. Yeah, I mean, I guess we were trying to... Yeah, in the very beginning, we were trying really hard to do more. You know, we, we were listening to bands like Braid and and bands like that who, yeah, and, or even like the Captain Jazz stuff is crazy. I mean, it's like, even when I listen to it now, I'm like, Jesus Christ, this stuff is like really, you know, tech, you know, musically proficient. So I guess we were trying to do kind of that stuff and in like our very sort of like amateur way. And then maybe, I guess, maybe a couple of years later when we had been doing it for long enough, we, we got a little bit better at it. Um, and just, again, different time signatures and weird stuff. Like, I was always, like, a big fan of, like, Rodan and some of the, the Louisville bands that were doing, like, really weird time signature stuff. And I would never compare us to that. But that's, you know, Fugazi and things who we were doing weird stuff like that that we would just try to emulate. I mean, again, when you're that age, you literally just, like, listen to the record and then go, okay, what's this part? Okay, let's copy that. And then Absolutely. what's the next part? You know? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you know, <laughs> but, like, you were sort of, like – very young yeah version of of like what a really amazing musician is doing but trying to sort of copy it in a way you get an initial in 98 it says on wikipedia mm -hmm. and then you do breakdance suburbia um so is that correct is that correct information on the internet? yeah well actually yeah no that's right it's just breakdance suburbia was like a, co a compilation of a bunch of different seven inches and split seven inches that we did i think there are some new songs that we recorded after we did our oh, it was a the boom the motion the music so that was like an ep that we did on oh the wait Canadian okay song. yeah so if i'm on spotify the first record is they love those who make the music yeah and then the boom the motion and the music and then breakdance suburbia and then the medicine yeah, so Breakdance Suburbia, it was first initial, asked us, they were like, we're doing a limited series seven inch, like, you know, monthly seven inch kind of thing. So they would ask lots of different bands that weren't on the label to like do a seven inch. So we got to do a two song seven inch with initial. And then I don't know, either they, either we, I can't remember, like they got on with this really well and like the seven inch. And I remember finally them being like, oh yeah, cool, like let's do an album. But in between the album, well, before the album was recorded, which would have been the medicine, yeah, they're like, oh let's let's put this seven inch on a like EP with a bunch of other sort of out of print split seven inches and things that we had done like yeah the couple of years before. So that was like a combination of a bunch of different seven inches and splits and stuff that we had done. Did you guys find when you got in the on initial that it helped actually no i don't want to go there yet because i want to talk about workshop records for a second just because the the thing that stands out to me is when i'm looking at the the artwork for they love those who make music the music is that was such that became kind of like this not the standard look but that's when albums when i would re see an album like that i was 
I would pretty much be like, they sound probably like this post hardcore <laughs> emo <laughs> thing. And I was always right. <laughs> so it's kind of yeah. like when you're saying before how you're getting compared to Jimmy Eat World and the Promise Ring and stuff, and I'm looking at this artwork, I'm like, the sound, I mean, when I was looking at some of your stuff, I was like, the guitar stuff reminded me of Promise Ring. Um, because, I mean, you know, that's just what I was comparing it to. But then the artwork, I'm like, okay, now you guys are putting yourself visually in that same kind of... Oh, yeah, totally. Well, our drummer did all the layout for for all those albums. So he was obviously right along with us at all the gigs, looking at all the layouts and T-shirt designs of all the bands at the time. So that probably just kind of bled into his um, version of uh, of what he wanted the album to sound like. I mean, he's still... Yeah, he's still obviously a graphic designer. He started his own. I mean, it's a good, it's a good fucking, it's good artwork. It's really, I mean, I'm a graphic designer and like, I, I love seeing band albums and stuff because I'm like, how did they get there? Yeah, that's what he started with. I mean, T must be fucking sick now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got like a really successful agency called Spark. I think they're based out of Doylestown, Doylestown because he's moved a few times. But yeah, so he was, he was there at all the shows doing... Uh, looking at the merch tables and I'm sure that just like bled into his subconscious and yeah we're all just kind of probably again trying to sound and look like a a much bigger band because that's kind of you know we were just young kids trying to like get to that level so I'm sure that bled into his sort of like design philosophy as well on subconsciously it does that though it really does if I look at that album now I'm like they look like they've been around for a while so that's pretty impressive that was your first <laughs> album's artwork because usually the first album's artwork is kind of like eh, you're kind of figuring it out unless you're yeah totally totally it looks like he's taken a fo- someone's taken a photo through a chain link fence and there's like a fire in the background or something do you know what that is? Yeah, I think he took that somewhere. He just like was out with some like, I remember he had some weird little cameras, like one was some weird Russian sort of film camera and, and stuff like that. And he, I think for one of his like, whatever you take in a graphic design degree, you know, one of the classes was like a photography based one. So he borrowed this weird little camera and took a picture of a fire somewhere. So yeah, it just was a cool image that he liked. And actually, I think, you know, except for Breakdown Suburbia, because that's like an illustration that one of the guys from Kindle did. Most of them, you know, were pictures that he just took, like the boom, the motion, the music was just a picture he took of us at in the studio from behind. And then the medicine is like me smoking a cigar. Like, I think he, again, he used them initially for like school projects and then they he just really liked them. So he then incorporated like those images into the graphic design of the the layouts of the records yeah both those records i mean I, I know some people listening probably don't give a fuck about this but just from a design thing i geek out like, they're really good they're they really pop it's just i don't know just really good artwork so you guys do two albums on workshop and then you then you go to initial and then they do breakdance Suburb, suburbia which is basically just a, a a like you said a combination of things you had released um so when they did that did workshop like sell them those songs or was there nothing like that happening no it wasn't even workshop it was like a couple different random people's little tiny labels you know like we did one of the splits with was myth ben carson july another split was god i can't remember but it was like just little labels you know so they were like more than happy to just like hand over the masters and be like yeah cool you know because they because we were you know they were like friends friends of ours and like yeah happy that we were going on to bigger and better things with initials so yeah, there was no sort of issue with that. Did you see any kind of, I don't know, I guess like bands expect when they're getting on a label or going to a new label that there's going to be some kind of new excitement or just advancement, I guess, in your in the path you're taking as a band? Did you guys see any kind of progression happening or happen pretty quickly or at all with Initial? It was it was actually a little bit before initial when we started to um, get booked by this girl Eva, still a really good friend who does fade a booking. Um, yeah, so she was booking Elliot. She was booking Hot Water Music. She eventually booked like um, oh, what's Matt Hensley's band called? Flogging Molly. You know, so she would um, you know I think sometimes she would, well first of all she would put us on opening bills with some of those bands and she would get us on some of the bigger festivals, you know, she'd be like, Oh, if you're going to take hot water music and Elliot, can you also put the jazz tune on? So they'd be like, yeah, cool, whatever, you know, they can play in the Saturday afternoon, you know, but we would still, you know, we played one of the gigs was down in Virginia, like 
opening up for Dillinger escape plans. So some of them were really cool spots. So I think that's also what kind of led Initial to be interested because even though we were in school, we were like touring every weekend and playing like the bigger festivals on the East Coast. So they'd always see our names on flyers and stuff like that. And I think Initial was the first one who really started to get us like reviews. And to be honest, most of them were pretty bad. Like they'd just be like, who the fuck is this band? They're trying to sound... <laughs> <laughs> trying to sound like the promise ring or, you know, uh, or whatever they said. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, I think the big one was though, they put us on a comp that oh, I wish I wouldn't remember the name, but it was like a free CD sampler that ended up in like loads of hot topics. Yeah. So it would be like free on the, on the, you know, the counter at, at hot topics around the country. And there was a lot of different bands on there from a lot of different indie labels, but um yeah, one of our songs ended up on there. And I remember like going to play some festival in Detroit where, you know, we'd never played Detroit before. And it's this massive like festival passes, with, right? yeah, 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 exactly. Loads of people knew that song and stuff, which we were just like, oh shit. So yeah, it was, it's just little bit, little things like that, that kind of built up. But then again, you know, if, again, if we were just trying to do like a jazz June headlining tour, there'd be like 10 people at each show, you know, yeah. but like we could... <laughs> you know, jump on bigger, bigger bands, opening slots. Like we played with Avail down in like uh, some random play, Denton, Texas, you know, not like the Denton, major cities. Texas, but like the- yeah. <laughs> Wait, did you play in the, did you, did you play, it was, we played there, we played in some old slaughterhouse. Yes, it was called like the, oh God, yeah, I can picture it in my head. We played there so many times down in Denton. Yeah, um, in the middle of fucking nowhere. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I can picture the place. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that we opened for a veil there and, and stuff like that. So those kind of opportunities definitely came through being, having a booking agent and being on, uh, initial, uh, again, because people, they might not know us, but they knew of Eva or the label. So they would like be like, yeah, check them on opening. Who cares? What in Denton, Texas, who gives a shit? You know what I mean? Yeah. Eva is a rock star. Actually, when I was, I was, I got her information when I was booking Chris from Elliot to do his interview. I went through her and she was like just doing the whole thing. And I was like, hey, do you want to be on this? And she's like, I do, but I'm really busy. Can we like follow back up on this? And I was like, yeah, because I'd love to get her respect. Because I talked to Yvonne. I, I interviewed Yvonne, who worked with Fade in the beginning and got like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was like really fun to hear that perspective. And it's cool because. There's always a, 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 a like a finger pointing blame game going on in the music industry when the shit's going a little bit awry between the band, the label, the booking agent, the show promoter, and it's been really fun these last four years to get what their each person's side is of yeah things. yeah totally. And Ivanj was was fun because she's just like yeah man I mean I could book as many fucking shows as possible but the band's not drawing it's not on me man you know it's like it's on yeah, them no, I was like exactly fuck yeah it totally it totally makes sense no exactly and it's like you know and half the time the bands would be like you know the, you know like a booking agent is like working their ass off getting them a gig and then they show up and be like we're only getting this much money and th- where's our fucking beer and all this other thing. Like, well, are you kidding me? You're not selling any tickets. Like, how do you expect to get, you know, it's, it is that sort of like ego thing of a band of like, well, we're the best band of the world, you know, and why aren't we getting, you know, we, you know, again, a veil got all this stuff. Why aren't we getting that? And it's like, they're Jesus, fucking a veil. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about Michigan Fest because I've, I used to own the DVD that it had i bought it because cole Les was on it and it was like they had got back together and then get up kid no i'm sorry not get up kids um uh death cab was on it too i don't know how many years they did it or they're still doing it whatever it is but like when you guys played what were some of the big bands that were playing around you i remember botch played and oh they were like, shit wow they were absolutely sick and i think it was botch and isis together it was like a package tour and yeah, they were, and I remember like, I hadn't heard either of those bands and it was just like, holy shit, you know, this is like, cause obviously like the hardcore thing turned into like metal earth crisis and stuff, but they were just doing this whole other sort of like, again, that like coalesced, just like fucking weird, noisy, loud, just scary kind of thing. And, and I feel like there was some sort of like minimal, but really cool light show that was going on on it too. I think there was, I feel like Ann Beretta played there. We were like a sort of like lesser known lookout band. 
you know, there were certain bands that we seemed to play with all the time that um, would all kind of like be on the same bills with us. And I'm sure, I think I'm sure Braid played that one as well. I'm pretty much, pretty much certain they did. So I can't tell you what year it was, but it was, um, it was a cool show, man. There's like a thousand kids there just packed in this big hall. And that was, and that, you know, and that was like very rare for us to be playing one of those shows. So that was definitely a really cool one. That, I was surprised actually, and I I interviewed Rob from Ann Beretta, so it's funny you brought him up. He was he was a cool dude to talk to. It's a singer, just just name dropping for a second. So <laughs> <laughs> just like people listening, it's like oh I can go back and listen to other episodes. The Michigan Fest thing, I don't remember hearing about that when we were a band, and it was later on in like the like two thousand eight or ten or something. I think when I bought that DVD. And I saw just the line. I was like, "How did I not know this was going on back then?" Because the the it was such a great show. Like all the bands on it were just these huge bands all in one room throughout the day, obviously. But I was like, "Holy shit, this this is amazing!" So I was like, when I saw you you guys played it, I was like, "Oh, I'm fucking jealous." <laughs> yeah, and, and again, like we just got an itinerary from Eva. Like we would just again, we would just say yes to everything. So she would just put us on anything, and that could mean that it was like a really shitty basement show at some kid's house in like Boise, Idaho, or she'd be like, oh, Michigan Fest this day at this time. And we wouldn't know the lineup and we'd show up and be like, holy shit, this is fucking cool. So yeah, I don't think I really knew about it until we played it. And then I don't know if it went on to be even bigger or whatever, but obviously not living out there. I didn't really like, because we weren't playing it anymore. I didn't go out and see it, but it was a really cool festival, man. And I'm even, we even played like a very early version of the fest in Gainesville, which was like, it was a cool show, but it wasn't sort of what it is now. Like, and it was funny because I remember kind of like not knowing that that had gone on. And I was like, Oh shit, that fest is still going on. And now it's huge. And it's like the sort of like this sort of like calendar date in the year for every band of that genre. Did you see the lineup that they just announced the full lineup? No. Oh, yeah, I think I did. I know I saw Hot Water Music on there. Yeah, like Painted Black just got on it. Um, who was on C? I I just want to... I Because I went last year and I liked it, but just three days of drinking is just so fucking brutal. It just gets so fucking old. Yeah, they got like Suicide Machines, Against All Authority just got on it. La Dispute, Painted Black. And this, like, this could be the same. It's like... Hot Water Music, Piebald, Bouncing Souls, Sam I Am, Kim Back Kid. This could literally be a a, a, a a sort of a set from like 1999. You know what I mean? These all the same sort of bands. <laughs> I mean, a lot of these bands too. I see that if you go back a couple of years, you're like, okay, there's like ten of them that played like five years ago. So it's almost yeah, kind yeah. of a regurgitation in a little bit where the bands are coming back, and you're kind of like, well, like I kind of saw them three, four years ago. I don't really know. But it was it was pretty fun. It was it was a cool thing. But yeah, you're right. It's huge. It's it's like I don't know how many venues, but it's all along, all in the town. So you can just kind of bop in and out of, of any venue and just go to the next one. So it's pretty fun. But when you guys played, it looked like it was just in a like I don't say a pavilion, but kind of a like a community center or something. Yeah, there was like two venues, and I remember there was always a bigger band playing at the other venue that we were playing to, but like uh, it was cool. It was in like a little club that, it was actually in a club that we'd played a few times, which again, I can't remember the name of. It was like, it wasn't, it was a pretty tiny place, like maybe 100, 200 people max. It was funny too, because I remember like every time we went down to Gainesville, to, and we'd always played the same club, we would um, just go to, was it Checkers? Is the checkers a chicken place? I can't remember. Yeah. It's got the, Check, yeah, yeah, and yeah, we would just sit across. We would like, uh, like get some like fries or whatever, and just sit in the parking lot and just watch all the frat kids beat the shit out of each other in the middle of the street. And it was just <laughs> like, <laughs> it was like that was like TV. We're like, all right, we'll just park here, and like in about two minutes, those kids on that side of the street are going to start yelling at those kids, and there's going to be a big brawl in the middle of the street, and we're just going to sit here and watch. We need our chicken. Exactly. <laughs> When you said you played um, before Dillinger Skate Plan in Virginia, was that Mac Rock? Yeah, that was Mac Rock. Yeah, we played that a couple of years. Holy shit. Dude, I, so we, to, to your point of being in the smaller venue where the bigger bands are in the bigger venue and all that shit, we got a show, because Mac Rock was all around whatever college town that was, and we played, we played a basement at noon, I think, in front of <laughs> oh, man. fucking like three people. And in the in the bill was, it was like 
Pieball Dillinger Escape Plan, Caven played. We got super drunk that night and we went and watched the Dillinger Escape Show. So I, I, I walked in, I think as they were playing. So that, and I think that was the set. So you guys probably had just finished and then they went on and then this girl got her like teeth knocked out or something. Yes. Yep. Yeah. 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 She yeah, was like 16 I, I or something. I, I don't think if we, I don't know if we quite played right before them. I feel like Ann Beretta played in between us or maybe a few bands, but they were the headliner, but I remember them just being fucking crazy. Cause you know, their music was so technical and weird and like so many different parts, but they would just be flipping out on stage, like swinging their guitars around. And it's just like, how do they play this music and do all that? <laughs> yeah. That technical <laughs> crazy shit. And you're like, how the fuck are they playing that while the, the guitar is getting whipped around his fucking his head yeah yeah they were crazy and yeah I do, yeah i think some girl did get their face smashed in my guitar or something unfortunately yeah i from what i remember and i've told the story a few times my my singer chris i think he was just she we, they were just bullshitting or something like that and i think either he saw her say this or she said to him she's like oh hold on i'm gonna go check this band out and then like a minute later they were like they were like carrying her off the floor because uh, she shit. got like st- jacked like jacked in the face or something like that i was like oh god so was that lane meyer that you were playing with around that time yeah okay because i feel like we must have played with you guys at the melody bar or something i know i remember you know obviously listening to this podcast i've i've known you know known the name but i'm sure we at least we were in the same circles of like you know some of those new brunswick shows or something but maybe not i don't know it sounds familiar. Like I feel like we did play with you guys, but I remember your name just from the beginning. Of this this whole conversation where I would see you guys pop up in zines a lot, or like samplers and things like that. From from what I can remember, and I remember you guys were from Pennsylvania. But I always thought I, th- I think I remember this too. And I'm I'm you know this is fucking twenty years after the fact, but I remember seeing like a name like yours be out there and be like, oh wow, like these guys are they're like mentioned all over the place. Like that's where we want to get to. Like, I feel like every band that I talk to, I'm always thinking about how much I was like, Oh, I always wanted to be where you were, (laughs) you know, or like, and you think that and you're like, man, we basically had the same exact thing, but we just had a bit more bigger shows or or something. Yeah. We're like around for maybe a a year or two more. The funniest was I remember like in between when I graduated Kutztown and we went on like our final sort of big jazz tune tour where we supported Elliot I was working at this little cafe in Red Bank called the Dublin House. I was just like the whatever serving coffee on this outside part. I put on like Built This Bill record one night and this guy was like, oh, is this Built This Bill? Did you put this on? I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, actually my band got to open with them, open for them once. He's like, what's your band? I was like, oh, we're called the Jazz Dude. And he's like, you're in the Jazz Dude and you have to work? <laughs> And I was like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> You're like, I've lost like $10,000 being in this band. I've never made a single penny from <laughs> the jazz dude. But yeah, his perspective was like, You're in the jazz dude? You have to have a job? <laughs> I feel like I've heard so many of those stories. Like, people would see their, like, someone from a band they really liked or they knew of, and they're like, and they were serving them food or coffee, like, just like that. And they're like, Holy shit what the fuck are you doing here? Yeah, you're rich. You're like, I'm in a band. I have to be here. It's the only way yeah, I make exactly. fucking money. What was your relationship like as a band in the van, just touring or... What am I trying to say? What were you guys... What was, what was your like relationship like as a band? I guess just leave it at that. It was always just like a normal sort of like bunch of dudes there's always be one person that we were always making fun of you know there'd be like the one person who all the jokes were directed to and (laughs) and most of those were towards our roadie who this guy adam was like the sweetest but craziest dude in the world who would just you know he was the most entertaining guy he was just always on like well, it was like a sort of like Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey on steroids, just like always jumping off of shit, saying weird stuff, making up crazy stuff. And we would just always be like, you know, making fun of him and, and each other. And, uh, you know, because we are all grew up, well, went to the same school and a lot of us lived together in the same shitty apartments and could stand and just, you know, shared record collections. So we were just kind of like all 
very much the same person. You know what I mean? We found each other very young, like 18, 19, and grew up with each other till, you know, the band was whatever, 21, 22, when we stopped touring. So yeah, we were just all like the same, just a carbon copy of each other, just like kind of all into the same kind of music and movies and everything else. So um, it was very sort of like friendly, tight knit thing. None of us, there weren't, yeah, luckily there weren't too many egos. And we're also, none of us were like assuming that we were going on to the big time. So we weren't like trying to oh, make really? it. You know? Yeah. Like there was just never really a, maybe like towards the very end, we could kind of see some of the other bands getting on the warp tour. Like we did a big tour, a bunch of tours with hot rod circuit and they started to open up for like, well, they got on vagrant and we're opening up for dashboard dashboard confessional and getting on the warp tour. And I think they even did a tour with like super junk and the get up kids, you know, so they, and we kind of, so we kind of saw that happening to other bands, but we never assumed that that was ever going to happen to us. We were just more like, I mean, we played so many shows. I guess we just all, I mean, looking back is crazy. This sort of like stupid show <laughs> routes that we went on and, you know, the amount of money that we lost, but it was just like, well, you know, this is what we're doing in between breaks in school. And I don't know, I had a job at the library, so I would like make like $90 every two weeks. And that seemed to keep me going through the school year. Plus on the weekends, we'd play a show like every single weekend. So we just like living in each other's pockets and, uh, didn't really have too many clashes like sometimes we would but for the most part we just like all kind of yeah really got along really friendly and we still do you know we I mean obviously I live in another country but when we get together it's it's just like we're back in the van again you know there's someone else I talked to that they had the same kind of thing where they didn't have this great expectation and their band got along great and then for me just the experience of wanting to get somewhere big it cr creates so much tension so i think that's probably worked in your favor and why i mean like we're i'm still friends with like all the guys in the band and stuff but like as a unit as a band when we get together that tension starts to kind of show up a little bit because <laughs> yeah. one person will just kind of be well i don't want do we don't really need to practice this much and we're like dude we really do and so it, it starts to peek its head out and you're like oh it's still here yeah i mean i was i became like a a little bit more like that after the jazz June because I had this other band called Snakes and Music, and we, you know, I was like, this is my last shot, you know, like <laughs> I'm I'm 22, I'm almost like retired, like <laughs> if if I'm ever gonna make it again, it's now, so I can't let anyone stand in my way. So like we had like four different drummers and kicked out, you know, like if someone didn't want to practice four hours twice a week we'd be like you're not fucking dedicated to the band you're out of here we can't you know we can't have you so yeah I, I was in that situation a little bit more with some other bands but the jazz tune because we were just in the school and doing it you know in our time our breaks from school and even just on the weekends it was like well you know we're all like i, I remember the guys in the mid cars in july like they'd go on a big tour and they'd go back home to sunbury pennsylvania in the middle of nowhere and work at a fucking gas station so they were like desperate to get back on tour where we were like you know well go back go back to our girlfriends and and go back to class it was a pretty fucking easy life you know outside <laughs> of <laughs> outside of touring and then the touring was just like so much fun because we had these you know, again, we would just work these random jobs in the summer, earn a load of money, and then just spend it all on a tour. So we'd be like, not too, too, too hard off. I mean, we did have times where, you know, we would have to rough it and sleep in the van. That was that was just because we just didn't have any cash on us, but we knew we could always just like go back and live live with our parents or whatever. There wasn't a lot of consequences to the whole thing. I almost wish I went back in time and did it that way. Even though <laughs> I I didn't like college and I quit college to be in a band, but I liked. I liked it when I went to put myself through school later on in my 20s. But yeah, it just seems like it, it would have been a lot more fun to have a lot less pressure on the whole thing. Because even like the bands, and I've said this before, like the bands who did make it, you know, who, who were making it at the time and were really big, I mean, they ended up eventually stopping. And a lot of them are, I mean, the, there's a lot of people out there too that are, that were in bands they're like real estate agents like a lot of them are real estate agents like so many do you, do you ever meet that guy cheese john cheese like, john yes. cheese. dude i interviewed john cheese he's a fucking oh, right. enigma he's crazy yes. i love you him did it i think i feel like i'm sure i listened to that episode because he was yeah he would come on he would start, i know he went on to be like roadie for my chemical romance and stuff like that but he yeah. would go on trips with us and he was like the funniest fucking dude ever and then 
Yeah, he went on to be. Now he sells like penthouses in Manhattan or some shit, doesn't he? Yeah, he's a realtor in uh, in Maywood, New Jersey. Oh, is he? Okay, Maplewood, Maplewood, okay. New Jersey. Yeah, it's it's funny following him because he has a band called the Rights the Rights of Springfield. Yes, yeah. and they and there's like these videos of him just playing, and they'll be at like a neighborhood party and they're playing and he's like hanging upside down there's little six-year-olds in front of him yeah. like confused. <laughs> it's so incredible blair from knapsack is one. Oh, that's right the, yeah. i think the drummer from thursday or potentially i just i keep seeing this pop but like fucking um fucking pj from armor for sleeve he's a realtor he hired me to do like i said like the instagram stickers for his for um his instagram there's just like so many fucking realtors out there it's hilarious it makes sense. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I find the same, like, so I work in marketing for a company that, well, now I work for a company that does like festivals and concerts and, you know, everyone from like Coldplay to like the idols. And, and I'm always like pimping us out to magazine, trade magazines, you know, like, you know, it's like that sort of like, I don't know, DIY, like trying to get people interested in something, you know, you kind of like really from being in a band and stuff like that, you, uh, you really develop that. Like, it's like a sense of like, no, man, this is really fucking cool. You got to check this out. you know, and if you, and if you deliver it in a way that is believable, people are like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds cool. And I'm sure it's the same with like a real estate agent. It's like, you have to check this house out. It's the best. Like, you're going to love it. You know, I can imagine it being that same sort of like promoter type of like, instinct that you have when you're really trying to get things going with a band or whatever i think there's an honesty thing too be because like everyone really took a lot of that don't be an asshole approach from from playing shows and a lot of people say that and i think that if i knew someone grew up in the punk scene i would trust them just me personally now that's not the majority of the entire fucking world but there's just something to people if they really are if that's baked into them that's going to carry through and kind of their I guess it sounds lame but they're like their energy and the way they're presenting yeah, it. yeah totally and you're like oh I trust you no I know I mean it's funny because like just thinking like and I don't even know where these like rules came from but I remember like somehow just being like if you play a show, you must stay for every band. You must watch the opening band. And if you don't, you're a fucking dickhead. You know, it's just like these sort of like almost rules that were somehow baked into you. Like you have to be nice to everyone at the show. You have to like not try to rip anyone off with like merch or, you know, if people are charging too much at the door, you know, those sort of like, yeah, those sort of like ethics that are like just baked into you of like just being a genuinely honest person and it's like you know it's obviously somewhat business related because there is a bit of money involved when you're like selling t-shirts and stuff like that so it was bringing that into like the world of real estate where you're not trying to rip people off and you're not trying to sell them a really shit house that has like a leak in the roof you know yeah i was talking to andrew from strife and he's like He's a realtor. I was like, man, does anyone ever know that it's you? <laughs> He's like, yeah. And he was so modest about it. He's like, yeah, you know, it's a couple times. And I was like, I'd be, I'd be shitting my pants. But like, dude, the, the guitar player from Strife is selling me my house. Like, it's fucking nuts. Yeah, you're like, I'm definitely buying that house. Even <laughs> yeah. though, just yeah. because it's the guy from Strife. Even though it's a million dollars, I'm going to go fucking broke. <laughs> yeah. doing this. Exactly. Worst <laughs> financial decision ever made. Based solely on the fact that he was in a cool band. <laughs> yeah, based on In This Defiance. <laughs> so 2002, you guys put on Better Off Without Air. And so by this time, you guys have one, two, three, four. You have four full lengths, and then you have a compilation of stuff on the um, on the Breakdance Suburbia uh, thing on initial. 97 to 2002, you guys are touring, but it seems like you're not really shooting for the moon or the stars or whatever. 2000. I always say it's like where 2000 comes around, downloads start to happen. You guys are kind of getting out of college. Like, what was the what was happening at that time to make you guys just split? Uh, well, there's a couple of things. So we had all graduated, except for Justin, the drummer, but his girlfriend was still in school the same year as us. We so we all basically like we, we all graduated the same year, and then he and Justin was always around. Uh, Kutztown because his girlfriend was still going to school there so we were still practicing loads and they were like okay we're graduated we're going to work the whole summer and then go on like a big because we were that was the thing we always thought like oh man we're always doing like the the tours in the times when the college kids are home so we felt like 
if we could do them when the college kids were in school, all the shows would be so much better. Like we have to go out from like September, like fuck the August, July, you know, tour in Boston where like, you know, 90% of the population are back at home. So that was the plan, like work the whole summer, make enough money so we could like go on this big three month tour around the whole US and then into Europe because we had a, a booking agent who wanted to book us. So we were going to do it on our own, but then we got this offer to open up for Elliot on their big US tour. We were like, fuck yeah, perfect. And then we went on it because we were like the opening slot. We didn't, you know, we weren't making a whole lot of money. Yeah, it was just a bit too, it was like the longest tour that we had done. And I think everyone was kind of like, uh, everyone's parents were like, All right, you know, you're graduated now, get a job. You need to start paying for your own rent and your car insurance. So there's a lot of like outside pressure on us. Like, okay, we get it, this tour, we're really going to really go for it and it's going to make us or it's going to absolutely broke it, break us. And, you know, we got halfway through this like big long tour, not making a whole lot of money. And everyone just started being like, should I do this or should I go back to being a graphic designer in some cool like Philadelphia, you know, design, you know, agency or whatever. So it started to like pull people kind of away from the that sort of like feeling of like this was going to be the big, the big, uh, you know, our, our career or whatever. And then the European tour got canceled and we tacked on a few shows at the end, like we coming back from wherever the hell we were. To, to the New Jersey, Pennsylvania again. But yeah, it just kind of like slowly ground us down. And we kind of realized like, this is, we thought we had put in a lot of time on the road to like build up a following, but realized like we had a long way to go if we were going to be like living off of it. You know what I mean? Because all the other tours were just like, oh yeah, we come home with no money, but then we go back to school and I get my job at the library and like whatever, everything's cool and our rent's paid by our parents or the dorm or whatever. But it was like coming home from that tour, realizing like I have no cash I need to get a fucking job right now because I do not want to go back to living with my parents at 22. So, yeah, that just kind of made it obvious that we weren't going to sort of like at our current sort of like whatever status or, or like level wasn't going to, you know, we couldn't basically we couldn't sell enough tickets, shirts and CDs to keep us you know, paying rent and everything else. Everything got a little more grown up and, and adult. But we did keep playing like we got this rehearsal space up in Sayreville. And we wrote that last album, Better Off Without Air. But I think we were like, all right, this is going to be something a little bit different because a lot of the bands like Saves a Day and Jimmy Eat World and stuff were getting on the radio, but we knew we didn't really sound like them. So we didn't really want to try to go down that route. So we thought, oh, we'll do something a little bit more cool and experimental. And maybe that'll be like our thing. It's really hard to just change tracks and have a totally new sound. Like you kind of have to work a lot to craft that. So I think it's a cool album, but it wasn't like, yeah, I think a lot of the reviews are just kind of a bit like, eh, okay, another Jazz June album. And that was kind of like the final nail in the coffin. Then we stopped working with Eva. So, you know, we didn't have people booking shows for us. And and, uh, it was just like the opportunities were like fewer and farther between until finally it was like, okay, no one has asked us to play a show in a long time. And uh, now when we call up up a venue like a, like one of the cooler New York City venues like Maxwell's they only wanted to talk to agents and we didn't have one anymore so yeah it just kind of fizzled out a bit so yeah there wasn't like a huge breaking point where we we're like okay we're all gonna break up but I think it just became obvious that it just wasn't sustainable as like a something to live off after we'd all been out of school and needing to pay our own way so real quick, uh, Maxwell's is in Hoboken, New Jersey, by the way. It's not New York City. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking of, what's the one in Lower East Side? West, uh, Webster Hall? Uh, yeah, Maxwell's is Hoboken, yes. And then... I figure like someone listening to this and be like, that's in New Jersey. <laughs> that English prick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who does he think he is? <laughs> Uh, yeah, any of those sort of like cool venues, even like Brownies, that was a place that was like down in you know, the Lower, e- Lower East Side, you know, th- th- those places started to close, you know, like with clubs, they they come and go so often that all of a sudden the promoter that you knew who'd book you any time, you know, the club wasn't around anymore, or they weren't working there anymore. So yeah, there's kind of like when you're, you don't have those opportunities. And you know, a lot of the opportunities came because Eva was booking much bigger bands. So again, they would just slot us on, you know, Flogging Molly played one week and we would open up the next week, but those opportunities weren't coming anymore. So did you have a bit of a identity crisis when the band was done? 
Well, <laughs> I started working like the worst job ever because I went to school to be an English teacher. But when I did my student teaching, I was like, fuck this. I don't want to be a teacher. Like, it just wasn't for me. I just wanted to be out of school at that point. And then I, I applied to like loads of different record labels in Manhattan, everything from like relapse to like these dance music labels. And like, they're all just like, oh, yeah, you can work for free. You can be an intern and work at bar at night and I was like oh, I don't know I kind of just spent like a fuckload of money getting a degree I don't want to I could have done that you know without going to school so I didn't really want to do that so I ended up getting this job at a fucking concrete company in New Jersey called Clayton Concrete I remember like just driving home from this really shitty job and hearing like Thursday on Z100 and being like motherfucker like <laughs> <laughs> No, like, <laughs> I appreciate like, how honest you are. I really do. It's amazing. <laughs> like, God damn it. Like, you know, yeah. And and then, yeah, I did. That was kind of a low point. And I was like, okay. But then from then I went to, um, I was like, all right, I'm not going to be a rock star. So maybe I should learn about what's going on in the studio. So I went to like the recording course in, up in Manhattan called like School of Audio Engineering. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll be like a studio guy, you know, so I'll get out of this shitty concrete job. And I did that for a while. Like I did some interning and some like at a at this really cool place called Pigeon Club in Hoboken. Year, a couple of years later, met, when I moved to London, I actually got a job writing for like an audio magazine which then started the career that i've been in for like the last 15 years so um what's yeah that? like i work I, what's, what do you do well it's just like all pro audio so i worked for the microphone company sure for many years i was working for another big distributor and they were doing like all sorts of cool you know studios and broadcasts and everything else so still sort of like music adjacent but not quite like in the music business itself but that's the but that actually suits me better because a lot less ego a lot more just kind of like techie nerdy kind of guys that i get along with really well when you guys did the the record in 2014 or no 2013 that was right right 2013 yeah yes the 13 yeah what prompted that like what where were you like or 2014 was on top shelf after the earthquake so like how'd you guys make that happen or like why did you guys make that happen well yeah like i said we had after like a sort of like touring days were over we did play a few shows here and there like um we played a benefit show for a roadie adam because he got a brain tumor so we like played a couple of shows to like raise money for his medical bills and stuff like that. And that was really fun. But then uh, we always kind of talked about, oh, we need to write some new stuff. And I don't know, again, living so far apart from each other, even then it was seem, you know, now it's even farther, but it was like New Jersey versus Philadelphia. You know, you can't practice twice a, twice a week. We just put it off and put it off and put it off and put it off. And then finally, Brian, um, our guitar player was like, fuck this. It's been too long. Life's too short. On the internet, we can like trade tracks and do all sorts of shit. And we can kind of like make up for the fact that we're not in the same place. Let's just do it. So we just tried it out and it just was really fun, you know, and it kind of an excuse for us to like, you know, have like another, well, this is pre WhatsApp and stuff, but like have like funny reminiscences about shit on like a big chat group and like whatever hotmail or whatever and, and trading tracks back and forth. And we just really like really started to sort of like get back in each other's lives. And then again, because I was still coming back pretty often to see my parents, I would just tack on like, and, and also because over here in the UK, you get like 28 days holiday. So I could just easily go to the States for two weeks and dedicate one week to family stuff and one week to band stuff. Yeah. And, and it just kind of like started to be a lot of fun. And, and those guys could fit it in because they were obviously um, like working and busy and stuff. But, you know, it was like once every three months that we would get together once every six months. And early on when we had started to do these demos we put a lot out like a message on our facebook like where's a good studio in philadelphia that we can record and people started to like recommend these different places but top shelf got in touch and was like oh if you're recording like we'd love to put this stuff out so then it kind of gave us a purpose it was like okay so we've got these demos that are kind of half finished but if we finish them and go to the studio like they're gonna pay for us to do a record like why the hell not 
and the, yeah, it just kind of motivated us. And, and in between, we would play cool shows, like I said, CMJ, and we did like a winter tour. We went up to the Middle East and in Boston and played like um, St. Vitus in Brooklyn. And um, then we opened up for like beach slang and the mineral reunion tour and like these little opportunities started to come up that kind of like kept us going and and the whole time we were like rehearsing but also writing new songs so it just yeah kind of i guess i hate the term but like organically kind of came together did you play the the mineral reunion show in new york city no it was in um austin um so it was like okay yeah it was like the night before the fun 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 fest they had a a show at a, a place called the Mohawk and it was like us into it over it, and mineral. Oh, wow. Um, but like, again, one of our, one of our old friends who used to book us a bit, this girl, Courtney, she got, you know, that beer company shiner. It's like a Texas kind of beer label. Yeah. They flew up me to, fu- they flew us all to fucking Texas to play this pre show gig which is some crazy you know what i mean like i, I can't I, i'm sure they lost loads of money but she just hooked it up and like all these little weird opportunities and then she got like gibson to lend me this like amazing les paul like it was just like what the fuck is happening we were just like this shitty little band from pennsylvania there was another like emo wave coming through with like i don't know i can't think of the name i guess yeah i can't remember the the bands and I, I remember like we played it was obviously like into it over it mineral was touring again american football came back so there's a bit of like a a thing happening so i think they thought they wanted to be kind of involved in that or it was just cool people from who from back in the day who were just still in the music business who were like remembered us and 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 yeah just wanted to help us out it's just like really cool like that same thing about that whole like punk rock ethic like helping your friends out kind of thing and and they just had like access to a bit more resources to fucking fly me over from london to austin to play this pre-gig party and i was like fuck yeah (laughs) that's awesome (laughs) you know what i mean that's so cool i mean it's also cool because like top shelf kind of just jump back to them they're a really good fucking label i mean they put out they have a ton of bands but like it it seems like they kind of dipped back they did braid you guys um but then like the newer bands like they or well i think i don't know if tiger's jaw is still on but like tiger's jaw touche amore um there's just like there's a huge, so many fucking bands in that label. I I colossals on there. Like I love I I really like that label. But at the same time, you, you know, they're you're saying you're a shitty little band, and this was a question I was gonna ask because they're on your Wikipedia. Obviously, you guys had to have made an impact a little bit because you're on Rolling Stones, um, oh, yeah. like top forty. What is this? Forty greatest emo albums of all time, and you guys are number thirty three in this list. And you know, this list has got fucking let's see the use this 40 panic at the disco into it over it um indian summer actually like indian summer i'm not gonna name the whole list but like co and camry is on here like you guys beat them um it's kind of cool man yeah you're only and you're only like you're like two behind jealous sounds killed them with kindness which is like one of my favorite albums of mine like ever yeah i mean the medicine was one of those ones where when it came out no one People liked it, but it wasn't like people like, whoa, it was the most mind blowing album that we ever heard. It was like another album of the Jazz June. It's cool. Next. So but it is it definitely has sort of like grown momentum over the whatever, 20 or more years that it's been out. And I think that's where on the Rolling Stones list, because I think people will say like that when they listen to it, like it, it just reminds them of a certain point in time of that kind of music. You know what I mean? It was like pre radio my chemical romance kind of thing so um i guess yeah i think it's because of that album that people kind of think that we're kind of amongst those sort of same bands as coheed and cambria but at the time like we were you know pale in comparison as far as amount of people drawn to shows and things like that not that that matters but i think sometimes it takes time though because i think people's ears because there's albums that have come out that I just mentioned Tiger's Jaw. Tiger's Jaw, their newer stuff, I love it. The older stuff, I couldn't stand it when I first heard it. And now when I listen to it, I'm like, oh, I really like this. Like my ears finally developed to a point of being like, where I don't understand why people like this. And then I'm like, oh, I fucking love this. But now is when I was ready for it. So I think it's like later on, which is also such a, it sucks so much ass because you put this album out and sure, you weren't like, again, trying to get this superstar status. But 
when you do this and everyone's like oh okay and then years later they're like hey rolling stone thinks you're great you're like really fucking now that's cool yeah i know 15 years later like at the time again we're in like this all stuffed into a van playing vfw halls for like 10 people but you know it's funny because a lot of people especially when we put out after the earthquake like people were like it's such a tragedy that this band never became huge and it's like I, I appreciate that i think you know it's 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 a compliment to say people thinking you know we were never recognized but at the same time it's like is that is that is that really important like is that to become huge like i feel like just putting out a good album is is good enough and and obviously if people are still listening to it 20 years later it means you must have been doing something right and i'm not saying like yes we deserve to be on you know like i'm not trying to say like the the medicine is an, an amazing album that deserves all this credit but i think it's just it is just a very like i think it's the sound because also right after that everything went very digital like everything was in pro tools and very clean and i and, and i sort of think about that now and i because i'm always listening to like you know like that riot fest thing i posted because i just want to I, I still want to listen to bands of that genre like the new bands you know like chastity and things like that i really like one thing i will say is that i think production wise a lot of those bands their reference point i mean i'm totally i don't know any of these people and i'm not judging them but I'm, I'm just saying as a general thing it feels like maybe their reference point for music is is trying to sound like the jimmy eight world record that made them famous and then on mtv like the production style is very like to a click track quantizing the drums like everything is samples everything is auto-tune and things like that so i think something like the medicine is just very raw very like nostalgic sound before some of those bands got bigger recording budgets and had access to much bigger studios and things like that so i think it's maybe more like the sound that people just like brings them back to their college dorm or whatever it was, you know what I mean? Because it's like a very like buzzy, um, you know, not perfect kind of thing. And, you know, at the time we had been playing for, I don't know, five, six, seven years, like pretty consistently every week and every weekend. So, you know, we're, we were kind of like a decent, a decent sounding band. It just, but, you know, to replicate something like that now, it, it's, it's probably, it's impossible. You know what I mean? For me, at least like to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's also like, I just think in general, every 10 years or five years, whatever it is, you're not going to be, I don't know, like the things that excite you five years ago, 10 years ago, aren't going to excite you now. So you're not going to give it as much energy. Yeah, exactly. It's like a certain type of certain point in time where we were like, and and all the band members, again, we we're all into the same kind of music and trying to like sound like some of the bands that were popular at the time, but a different, our own spin on it plus taking all sorts of different influences. Yeah, it's a pretty cool thing that like we had the opportunity to have that time to like make that album cuz it took like 2 years writing and then we got to record with fucking Jay Robbins from uh Jawbox at Inner Ear Studio where like every awesome Oh, there you Discord go. Re <laughs> record was Jeez. recorded. So, it, you know, and the only reason that happened was because Blue Tip like booked the studio for two weeks and they got in the first couple of days and realized they didn't, we weren't ready. So there was like a week open at the studio and our label was like, if you can get to fucking DC now, you can record with Jay Robbins. And we're like, get in the van. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? we're, and we had it down in a fucking, literally in a blizzard. We're like, we have to get there. You know, we don't care if we like die trying, but, and then, you know, so maybe some of that, excitement and and you know went into those sessions as well kind of for lack of a better term like a sort of like magical moment in time for all of us that um ended up being recorded which is really cool and you only had a week or a week and a half yeah it feels like it was a week and we just and it was great because jay jay robbins was just so like totally got that we had a very limited budget but we wanted to make like the best best record possible so it wasn't like going into a studio where they're like well you're just gonna have to accept that take because I'm, I'm you're only paying me for two days and i know that you can only do this you know you need to do a whole album he was just like okay i'm gonna do this and this he was like just so charged up and like getting us to like do as much as we could as 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 long or as long as we could because he he like appreciated who we were and the budget that we had but wanted to make like the best possible record we could in six days it was it was a really cool 
cool situation. I mean, that probably works in your favor. Sure, you hear the stories about bands having six months to make a record. I think that if you have a deadline for anything, if anyone has has a, a deadline or not, if, if anyone doesn't really have a deadline and it's, oh, we can get it done within a couple months, you don't, there's no urgency. You don't really show up as 100%, but when it's a short amount of time, like you can't fuck with that time. You're going, I have to bring it every single thing I do. And that's going to bleed into what you make. Yeah, totally. I was just recently listening to an interview with um, one of the guys from Cave In on, a, on another podcast, and he was like, yeah, we went to L.A. and we stayed in these apartments and we wrote these songs and we did like 15 versions of this one song over, you know, because they just, you know, like, how do you make a decision in that sort of thing? Because you can always do something different or better. I mean, I find it now the same, you know, even when I'm writing songs now, it's like, you know, I just have to get to a point where I'm like, this song is done because I could work on this forever. And I'm probably going to end up with a shittier version of like the original inspiration that I had. But yeah, if you just had like an opportunity or pressure or expectation that you were going to sell records for a major label, you would just be like, oh, it's just not good enough. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And then who the hell knows what kind of record you'd end up with. I'm not saying Cave in ended up with a bad record because of that, but it, I just sort of recognize that situation of like a bunch of 22-year-old kids in L.A. constantly recording the same song over and over. It would drive me insane. Yeah, but they're also I'm not not dismissing what you're saying. I think it, it, it for what work was that for an ant- antenna? It was either that or um, the one after that with like the blackout or something. I forget what it was called. Yeah, it may have been Antenna. I think Antenna was when they had the budget. That's when they got signed to the major and they were like torn with Who Fighters. Like that record's fucking great. I mean, I but I think that what I was trying to say with Cave In is. I remember reading an interview about them, and they're like, yeah, every time I get extra money, I just buy another pedal because they have so many pedals <laughs> and so yeah. many effects. So I think like they're the kind of band that would thrive in that situation because they're like, we are going to mathematically dissect this entire thing because we're geniuses in that sense. For anyone else, it would be daunting and a goddamn nightmare. I mean, Brendan from Lawrence Arms, I was listening to his podcast, he used to talk about it a lot, and he... A is one of my most favorite podcasts I've ever listened to, and B, his whole approach to songwriting is like if I, and I don't know how how much he sticks with this, but I I, I would give him the credit that he's not bullshitting me when he says this, when he's like, or his audience, he's like, if I the best songs I write, it's like if I if I can't write it in five minutes or whatever it is, like then I just throw it away, and and he's like because he goes he's listened to so many bands say like, Oh, like never smell like teen spirit. Like, yeah, I wrote that in three minutes or whatever it was. And he's like, so I just took that and said, all right, I'm just going to write as many songs as possible in that time frame." And he goes, the best ones that come out that everyone loves are the ones that took that long. Yeah. And like, you're, there's so many stories you hear about like the band that's in the studio with the budget. And then they like, Oh, I don't know. Uh, I wrote one night. I wrote this one song. And the next day I played it for the producer and like, that's the one. And that became like the smells like teen spirit. You know what I mean? Like the one huge, they just wrote it in two seconds in their hotel room. And then that became like the big song that everyone now knows. So yeah, who the fuck knows, man? But I know what you mean about Cave In. Yeah, there are certain bands that like given that opportunity and given that time will create amazing things because yeah, they're just kind of on another level though, aren't they? Yeah, they live in they live in outer space basically yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, we're on, dudes. Uh, before i start wrapping this up i had a question about so on the boom the motion and the music there's the first song when the drums kick in <laughs> okay i started listening to that song and it takes like 33 seconds before the fucking song kicked in. <laughs> yeah. it annoyed the shit out of me did you guys get any backlash back in the day for that song doing that no, but like... Because I was just like, this <laughs> is fucking ballsy. Just get to the goddamn song. And because back then, you had a... It was a CD getting you there. Like, I couldn't just open up and just kind of... It just use my thumb and push to the, you know, the 15 seconds or whatever it is to give you like, where the fuck is the guitars or the drums kicking? No, it's it's funny because remember I was saying we had a song on a... Whatever, like a Hot Topics. That was the song. So apparently not, like... <laughs> <laughs> and it's got the thirty. It's got like thirty nine thousand streams. It's your most, it's your most streamed song on your account. Let me see. 
No, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, the scars to prove it's got two hundred and twenty two thousand. But it yeah, it's like number four. It's 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 way up. I there. don't know, man. No, I totally know what you mean because when I listen to it, I'm like, why are we just playing the same? It's the same part too. It's not like we're doing something different. It's just like, nee, 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 and I'm just playing that one. I don't know. I think no, it's the it warm up must... part. Like the, it's not you guys. It's you guys just dicking around in the studio, and then the song starts. Oh it's, right, yeah. No, so it's the part <laughs> before that. I'm like, what the fuck? It's 33 seconds of them dicking around in the studio. Then you're like, all right, let's go. And then it kicks into the song. Yes, and okay. and the whole time I'm like, is this when the drums kick in? Like, is this why <laughs> they called it this? And so, like, did you guys name that song that after it was on the record? Uh, no. Um, I God, that song is so funny because when you look back at, like, some of the, the ideas that I had when I was, like, 19, I remember writing that song in, like, my – English literature class because I was super bored. But I think the whole thing with that was just it, it is the build up to like because we had played a lot of shows at that point and it is like that anticipation of like when is this when is it gonna kick in like you know that intro thing and like everyone's kind of just like waiting and ready for like something to happen and you know it's coming and it's like oh it's not yet but I can't you know almost like the equivalent of like the sort of like the drop in a you know, sort of like EDM song where it's like, do you, do you, do you, do you, you know? And, and that's kind of like what I wrote the lyrics about was that like anticipation of like, uh, so yeah, so, so no, it, it, it was, it was called that before we sort of recorded it. But yeah, that whole thing in the beginning, we did that on one of the other albums too. I guess the album before that was just like random bits of practice tape that we just like spliced together for an intro that makes no sense. But I don't know. At the time, we were trying to do something that I couldn't, you know, it seemed cool at the time. But um, it just, uh, yeah, just kind of funny to listen to now. Yeah, as the kids say, it triggered me. <laughs> <laughs> I started asking this recently. Is there any, like, story, because I've seen you done a bunch of interviews. Is there any story that you've never got to tell and then uh, about like back in the day that could be could be whatever kind of story it could be funny it could be like insane it could be you know something you're like i shouldn't be telling this um that you'd you've never done another interview that you'd get the chance to do now um yes actually um so there was so going back to you know remember i said that i was working at the cafe and the kid was like you just built this bill and I was like, I opened for Built to Spill. So we got to open for Built to Spill at this place called the Chameleon Club down in like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, oh, so this the, place. That's a video on YouTube too, right? Yeah. Okay. So we played there a few times. We, did, we, we played with the Get Up Kids there once. But so this guy who booked down there, I forget his name, but a really nice guy. And he was like, I'm booking Built to Spill or, or Built to Spill asked to play or whatever it was. Do you guys want to open? We're like, Jesus Christ, yes. They were like my favorite band at the time, like Perfect From Now On had just came out and we're like, it was like life affirming moment. Like, yes, we will open, like whatever happens, we will open the spill. And then, um, but like, because they're in Warner Brothers, when they, when he said, oh, I've got this local band, the Jazz Junior to open, they're like, no, we're putting some shitty fucking New York City band on Warner Brothers to open. He was like, no, you're fucking not. It's going to be the Jazz Dude. And I don't know why. Like, I don't know what he fought for us, but he really like was like, no, they will play or Built to Spill won't play. And finally, Warner Brothers is like, fine. You know, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why you're arguing with this and you're going to potentially lose a Built to Spill gig. But if that's the deal, fine. Let the Jazz Dude play. We were like so excited. We practiced like more than we ever had for any show. So we get there, we meet Doug March. He's like the coolest guy ever. They're just like the nicest dudes. We go up there, we play our gig, which was like fine. Like we played good. Like we didn't fuck up. Like we were so nervous that just not having it go horribly wrong was like all I needed. So we played our gig. F cool. Didn't, didn't fuck up anything. It was just like, yes, now I'm going to like drink a beer watch like my favorite band so i was walking from the backstage into like the venue with like a beer bottle and all of a sudden i just get yanked by the fucking collar all of a sudden like you know one of those moments where you just stopped in midair this bouncer's like no fucking glass in the venue and i was like okay man that's cool i'll go to the backstage and pour my beer into a cup 
He's like, get the fuck, you know, just really aggressive. So I was like, okay. So at that point, I'm kind of drunk. So Built This Pillow plays a few songs. And I go up to the um, go up to the bathrooms upstairs to like go to take a piss. And I walk in there and I'm pretty drunk. And everyone's like using all the stalls or whatever. I'm like, does anyone care if I piss in the sink? And everyone's like, yeah, go for it. And then while I'm pissing in the sink, I go, man, the fucking bouncers are here. The bouncers here are total assholes. I, you know, blah, blah. And then, so I leave the, the bathroom and I'm, and as I, as I'm coming out, some kid was like, oh, I really liked your set. And I was just, he had never heard us before. So I was like, yeah, we've got a few albums out and blah, blah, blah. Just talk. And then while I'm out sitting outside the bathroom, this like enormous dude comes through and he goes, you're the motherfucker who pissed in the sink. And he was like one of the bouncers who was like behind one of the stalls. So I didn't see oh, him, no. <laughs> but, but he heard me going, can I piss in the sink? And all the bounces are here are fucking assholes. <laughs> <laughs> so he like, oh my God. Grab, <laughs> so he literally like grabs me from under the shoulders and like hoists me up. And he's like, throws me into the backstage area. He's like, you're not fucking going anywhere. So at the time, this other guy from the Jazz Dune, this guy, Tim, who um, he wasn't like a permanent member, but he he would play like keyboards and trumpet on one song. So but he was like a really feisty, tiny guy. And he was like, why are you touching my friend? You know, totally like six times smaller than this guy. So starts talking this shit to this mad, this massive bouncer. So finally, bouncer's like, just get the fuck out of here kicks us out of the back door and we're like, we need our guitars. He's like, you wait till the show's over. So we're like, we had this brilliant idea that we would just walk around the front of the venue and get back in. But then when we walked around the front of the venue, all the bouncers were there with the guy who had just kicked me out. He was telling, <laughs> he oh, was telling no. the story and we walked in and I'm like, I literally had this moment of like, this is when I die. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Like nine of the biggest bouncers in the world are standing here and they, they had a reputation in that club for like beating the shit out of kids all the time. And I just knew that. I was like, this is like just walking into the hornet's nest. But the funny thing was they were like, you know what, man, we try really hard to have everyone had a good time in this venue. And, you know, for you to go around talking about us like we're mean, you know, they were like really... <laughs> They gave us like this guilt trip of like, we're just trying to like put on a good show for you guys and have everyone be safe. And we're like, oh shit, you know, so <laughs> it was just the weirdest oh, fucking that... situation ever. And then, yeah. And so anyway, I only got to song about, see about like three Built This Bill songs and got kicked out of the venue. But, um, you know, I still can say I opened for them. Oh, that's but I got... fucking crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, it such was a funny, funny man. story, dude. That's hilarious that they were like that. They're like, you know, man. <laughs> yeah, it's not nice. I mean, we had another one where we we were playing in um we were playing in for the for Elliot show. We played at this place called Twisters down in Arlington, Virginia. And after the no, show, we were all... that was that's in Richmond. Oh, sorry, Richmond. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, and we were walking home to the guy's house who put on the show, and these two guys came up to us like, yo, man, you got a cigarette? Like, no, we don't smoke. And they're like, no, oh, hold up. Give me your wallets. And we're like, uh, we don't really have any cash. And the guy pulled out, like, one of those, you know, like the little gun that, like, the Bond girlfriend has underneath her yeah, pillow? Yeah, like, like, <laughs> like, it's, like it's like a cigarette lighter, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He pulled out one of those. And he was like, give us your fucking wallets. And we were like, man, like literally I've got $5 in my pocket. <laughs> and I was like, and we're like, if we, we give you our cash cards, we're just going to go cancel them immediately. So they'll be pointless. Can we just like give you the cash instead of like giving our wallets with our license? Like we're trying to reason with these guys. Like it'd just be so annoying for us to have to reapply for our driving license and get a new bank card. And it's got all of my detail, you know, like my direct deposits. And, um, and he's like, fuck this and shoots the gun. And we're like, Oh, uh. Holy shit. <laughs> so he just shot it up in the air. Cause he was just pissed off that we weren't like taking him seriously. So we just like legged it down the street to this guy's house, came into his house, called the police. They showed up like immediately. And then we got in the car. They're like, we're going to find these guys. They ended up finding the guys like two blocks away. And and they were both one was dressed in like 
a whole like red jersey, you know, like head to toe, like bright red. And the other guy was dressed in like head to toe white. And all they had done was swap shirts with each other. So we're like, uh, <laughs> those are the guys. <laughs> those can't be them, officer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Onwards. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so we, basically, so we basically got shot at, but he didn't hit anybody. Holy fuck, dude. Wait, when you say you ran, he shot the gun in the air and then you gave him your wallets? Well, no, we all like gave them. We just were like, here's the cash that's in our wallet. But it ended up being like probably a total of like $30 because I was like, I've got a five. You know, I got five dollars. You've got ten. You know, we're just like a band on tour. We didn't have like the cash with us. And because we were just like being such little pricks, he was just really annoyed, you know, that he had that he got no money. So he just shot the gun in the air to like scare us off. So we just like ran away. Um, he didn't shoot at us, luckily. But um, yeah, yeah that was a fucking scary that situation to be in. Fucking crazy, man. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. And then we ended up having, to, we were supposed to go down to court, like to testify against these guys. But I was like, uh, I live in New Jersey now. I can't be bothered to drive down to Arlington, Virginia. So uh, to Richmond, sorry. So uh, I don't know what happened to those guys, but um, yeah, never got the, never got the cash back. Oh my God, dude, that's crazy. Yeah, I was not expecting him to actually shoot the gun. I thought, I literally thought with a lighter, <laughs> like a fucking, that's crazy. Well, I'm uh, I'm gonna wrap this up. This has been great. Um, I've really enjoyed this a lot. Yeah, man. Uh, so two questions uh, before the last one. What would you like to plug? It could be about you. It could be about a friend. It could be about both. Yeah. So I just we're just putting out an EP, or it just came out like a couple of days days ago. So my new band from London is called Post Skeleton. We just put out an EP on Friend Club Records, so you can find that all on the internet, whatever, Bandcamp and stuff you want to it's also on spotify they're also when does this come out uh will be after the 14th of june let's see so i got uh so this week then next week and the week after so this is going to probably come out the 24th the 24th or the first if i get lazy perfect the friend club is also like reissuing the medicine on cassette for the first time um on Friend Club Records as well. So those are the two things, the Post Skeleton EP and the yeah, Medicine on Tape. How do tapes do these days, by the way? Because I see that a lot. I don't know, because I I don't, I mean, they seem, I think everyone seems to do limited edition. And of course, if you sell, you make 50 copies of anything, you probably eventually sell it to all your friends. So I think it just always seems to be like, just some way to have something in addition to like the Spotify debut, which is just so like lame as a sort of like (laughs) release. It's like, Oh, we made a tape so you can buy that. And then just basically download the songs if you want to, or just listen on Spotify. So I think, I don't know if they sell a lot. I mean, you can't make a lot of money. I don't think, I don't think anyone's like making money, but I think the deal with friend club is like, Hey, we'll put out some tapes, and if we sell loads of them, and we feel like there's a demand, we'll put out vinyl. So it's kind of like just a little a way for a label to like, you know, have some some cash, and then if they feel like one of their releases is doing really well, they'll fork up the cash to actually press vinyl, which uh, is a little bit more expensive. Tapes are super cheap, so it's kind of a cool way to have a have a little bit of a physical something or other yeah i'm surprised that that record wouldn't be on vinyl it seems like i don't know it seems like that would be a record that's out there that is that like available on vinyl well the medicine was pressed on vinyl but i think it sold out because again it was like top shelf and the guy from into it over it kind of did a split release on his label but they only pressed like 50 and all sorts of crazy vinyl uh, colors and stuff and they all sold out they never repressed it uh, okay, I was gonna say, I was like, that seems like a missed opportunity. If they didn't do that. Yeah, yeah, and I think the friend club guys just wanted to. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they'll do a vinyl version of it or not, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, at this point, they're doing like the cassette release. Um, so yeah, it'll be like a. They're calling it the Jazz June June. So uh, that's the the marketing s- s- uh, phrase. Um, but yeah, those are the two things going on for me right now. Cool, man. All right, last question. What scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? Um, I think it's just, you know, kind of the things that we were talking about before, just generally being like a, you know, thinking about 
someone other than myself and the decisions that I make, whether that be my kids or, you know, just friends or the environment or, you know, like um, just not being like a greedy bastard and trying to help out and other people who are suffering or have less or in the wartime situation, you know, just trying to like think about your community um, and doing as much as you can to kind of like help people out who are in a, a worse situation than you, I think 